All right, Tom. Okay, thank you, Lou. Thanks to Scott for the technical arrangements. Thanks to the people who are here in the room and those who have joined on Zoom. That uh, I guess the last minute adjustments are being made to make sure I've got the right volume and the right distance from the mics. I think everybody here knows who I am, uh, but on a chance that with the video or the, the, the Zoom, uh, I'll introduce myself as the host of the of the series. My name is Tom Finger. I'm a member here at First Church. That uh, I am a fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute at Stanford uh, Institute on International Studies. I've now spent half my year, half my career at Stanford, 26 years at Stanford teaching and 26 years um, working for the federal government, most of that in, in D.C. That I took this topic, geopolitics and the transition to greener, cleaner, more sustainable technologies for two reasons. One is I like to use at least one of the sessions every year in the series to um, educate myself, uh, something that I know a little bit about and would like to know more. Uh, I was helped in making that decision this time because I failed to find anybody willing to take this on. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated topic and the article that is in the workbook, for those of you who have read it, kind of identifies elements of the problem, but it doesn't actually put together, in my view, a very coherent analysis or prescription about what to do. So I can understand why people who formally work on this subject didn't want to tackle the combination that's here. Um, by way of qualification to speak on the subject, um, part of it has to deal with U.S.-China relations, great power rivalry and the way it is set up as the competition for supremacy between the United States and China, and how that might affect access to a large category of metals and minerals that are needed for the transition. Uh, rare earths is the shorthand, but cobalt, lithium, and others that are not rare earths that are important for batteries and other elements of the technology. So there's the US-China part that I have worked for 55 years. Early in my career, I worked export controls uh, on the advisory panel of the US Congress to rewrite the Export Administration Act. And a portion of this article deals with U.S. efforts to control access to technologies that will be important in the post-hydrocarbon, more sustainable development arena, but also in the idea of competition with China. And finally, energy. Uh, in my kind of strange career, I've also worked on energy issues um, beginning in the 1970s, uh, when among other positions, I was the American co-chair of the US-China Energy Policy Workshop. Uh, one of my counterparts went on to become premier. He did better in his system than I did in ours. Um, and most recently, uh, I'm on a board of an organization that did a major program on hydrogen fuel and hydrogen as a storage mechanism for energy. So this was a chance for me to think about dimensions of a subject that is often tossed about with, to me, inadequate attention to how the pieces fit together. So what I'm going to try to do this evening is to first separate and then begin to weave together some of the many strands of policy consideration that 
will have to be a part and are shaping approaches, funding, arguments about the transition to sustainable forms of energy. The way in which the article in the workbook, which again, it's not necessary to have read it, uh, sets this up, is to ask the question and imply an answer about whether and how geopolitics will affect the transition from hydrocarbons to what comes after. That he does this by first identifying several of the elements of a sustainable energy mix, hydro, nuclear, wind, solar, um, uh, geothermal, and then looking at where they are located, just the geography of them. Uh, energy resources of all kinds are not evenly distributed around the world. And the metals and minerals, uh, we use, I'll use rare earths as a shorthand. Please understand it's a larger set of materials that is at stake. And rare earth does not mean rare. It's a, it's a category on the periodic chart. Uh, they're actually quite abundant. They exist in many, many parts of the world, including the, the largest known deposits are in the United States. Uh, but in the way that the subject is talked about conventionally now in the media, uh, the pundits point to 65% of the exploited resources, those which are being mined now, are controlled by Chinese firms. And 80% of the processing of them are in Chinese-owned firms. And the implication one is supposed to draw from that is that it gives China a great deal of leverage over the rest of the world. Uh, it controls the next oil uh, equivalent. Um, not not true, not accurate, but a part of this story. The other part of the story as it's set up in the chapter is that the US rivalry with China, this competition for supremacy in the world, uh, gives rise in the United States to efforts to restrict access not to resources, but to technologies. The one that's in the news a lot is advanced semiconductors and, and chip manufacturing uh, capabilities. But the broader idea is that China has leverage because it controls the resources. The United States has leverage because we momentarily um, uh, have some control over critical technologies. And the implication is that both countries will use these points of leverage because of the larger geopolitical rivalry and that the all important transition to sustainable uh, uses of sources of energy will suffer, will be delayed. And the implication not really spelled out in the article is that for the sake of the greater good, the people of the world who need a cleaner environment, uh, lower, you know, smaller carbon footprint, sustainability over the long haul, the United States should lift or not impose additional restrictions on technologies that would be needed for exploitation and should reduce friction with China, reduce the tension, reduce the competition. Therefore, the rest of the world would have access to the resources and the technologies and could hold hands and sing Kumbaya and march together into a, a brave new future. Uh, I'm being a little sarcastic about the argument, but that's the implication of it, the way it is laid out. Uh, which is a nice idea, but the argument has many, many 
flawed pillars, at least in my experience. So what I want to try and do is deconstruct this, take it apart. What are the elements of the argument? What are the elements of the transition that it is talking about? And what are some of the politics around resolving the issues that are inherent in or result from the interaction of the different parts? Um, of course, we will have questions at the end. If I say something that's simply unintelligible, uh, shoot up your hand or Lou will be following for, for questions online. But let me start with the basic premise of this, uh, which has identified the primary character of the current era as one with the return of great power competition. I don't know what that means, actually. Um, to me, as a political scientist, it is intellectually lazy. Because the way it is playing out is that let's replay a version of the Cold War. Substitute China for the Soviet Union. The United States retains the good guy role in this. And if it is a replay of what we went through from roughly 1945 to 1990, then there is justification for retaining or revitalizing a whole series of policies that served us well. We didn't lose the Cold War. So there is a, an intellectual laziness and there's a policy laziness and there's a policy inertia because specific groups within the United States, other systems, were empowered by those policies. Uh, the one I'll mention in passing is the oil and gas industry. Uh, critical, critical for economic development, critical for military power, and has been enjoying very lavish subsidies for a half century. Uh, it's so important to us that we cannot rely simply on market mechanisms, is the argument. Jumping ahead to where I'm going in this talk, the need to develop our own supplies of rare earths, again, writ large, the need to advance, maintain technological superiority in critical fields, is another argument for more subsidies, more tax breaks, more money for research and development, and something is the Chips and Science Act adopted now two years ago, that uh, it's an industrial policy for the United States, which we've rejected explicitly several times, but it's an argument that is built around this, the importance of technology, the next energy, uh, system and international uh, competition. The capacity, the reputed capacity of China to use the leverage it purportedly derives uh, from this control ignores the downsides of trying to, to use it. That um, And I can illustrate that with a, a, a real example, that in 2010, there was a clash off of the Senkaku Islands near Okinawa between Japanese and Chinese uh, fishing vessels and Coast Guard vessels in it. And both claim these islands. Nobody lives on them. They're completely uninhabited. The U.S. position is they belong to Japan. Uh, and they are covered by the treaty that we have with Japan. And the reason we have a clear position on ownership is because we seized them at the end of World War II. We controlled them until 1972. And then we returned them to Japan. So we explicitly, in U.S. law, subordinated them to Japanese administration. So these are Japanese rocks out there, uninhabited. 
but fishing takes place near them. A clash as part of the political gamesmanship, the Chinese either did or did not restrict for a period of time Japanese access to rare earth elements. I say apparently include deliveries never stopped. The ability to purchase was disrupted for a time. So there's lots of cute gamesmanship around words. So regardless of the reality, the duration was short and the costs to China in terms of demonstrating it behaved as an unreliable supplier spread across a very wide swath of uh, production and supply chains in it that you have to say somebody must have thought this was a good idea they didn't have the yeah but what's act two uh, on this so they become unreliable suppliers the question of how did china get to control 65 percent of rare earths being produced again the narrative and the narrative is carried in the article is that this was a diabolical plot by the Chinese to control this critical set of materials to give them leverage. That's not the way it looks to me. Um, we were mining rare earths a uh, number of places in the United States. They were mined in South America. They were mined in parts of Africa. They're, it's very dirty. It's very polluting. So this was a case of companies choosing to export environmental degradation. The Chinese at the time were much less worried about protecting the environment and a lot more eager to capture the foreign exchange that, that came out of this and the technologies that they could acquire. So it's not, in my judgment, a political motivation. It's an economic motivation. It's an economic motivation plus political stick with the United States. The mining companies that for lots of reasons in lots of parts of the country and having to do with lots of stuff that exists in the ground were not happy with environmental regulations. The environmental impact studies so they went where it was cheaper. They went where they wouldn't be getting beat up for damage to the environment. And they went there while saying to our government, the Chinese are gonna eat our lunch because they're now controlling all of this stuff uh, because the laws in the United States are too stringent and too constraining. So the, the minerals exist in the ground. We stopped producing them. Now, after the 2010 episode uh, with Japan, companies got serious again about looking for them, got serious again, I got you, Robert, about leaning on the Department of the Interior to modify uh, regulations in the United States. And we went on a serious effort to find these things. And may many of you may have read, I know it's about two weeks ago, uh, the largest deposit of this stuff in the world no, it was discovered in Wyoming. Uh, it'll take a decade, apparently, to bring this into production. Robert? Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt. Why did you stop producing? Partly cost and the anticipated cost of meeting new and more stringent uh, requirements on the effluent from the mines that stuff that had to be cleaned up to a higher level than it was. Um, what was the question, please? I'm sorry. The question was, why did we stop producing rare earths? And my short answer was economics. I don't, I don't think I can give you one that I have confidence in as to what it is beyond 
companies that produce this stuff, many of them operate worldwide and chose to invest the money in parts outside of the United States that didn't have the same six, eight, 10 year, get approval, get all the licenses and doing that both because they wanted it in production, but also for the political point that um, uh, we are tying ourselves up in knots as a nation and we are uh, making it harder to compete um, with our rival. Good question. Which rare earth minerals were there, were found in Wyoming? Well, apparently the whole including, schmear that are used. Including cobalt? The cobalt's not a rare earth. Co cobalt, it, it, it's important, but it's not one of the rare earths. But that's another problem anyway, because we need it for the batteries. And right. apparently the largest mining of cobalt is in Congo, which right. is all controlled by China. Well, the mine is operated by China. It's still controlled by Congo. I mean, that's one of the aspects, not just for China, but for the, the way the world works. Um, at end of the day, Countries have agency they, in the jargon. They have the capacity to take away the license, to close down the facility, to nationalize the facility. All of that is perfectly legal under international law. And this may be time for a digression, 2009. Uh, when I first had retired from the government, I was in China and the international liaison department of the party asked to see me. So we need your help. I say, I assume you mean the United States, not Tom Finger. And it's, yeah, yeah, we need your help. Uh, Africa. That for decades, China's position was no strings. We'll make loans, we'll do investment. We don't make anything conditional. We give you the opportunity to do this and you do it. Uh, and now we're discovering that deadbeats don't pay. We have no leverage. And I said, welcome to my world. Um, that the Chinese have structured a lot of these things in ways that actually don't give them much leverage um, if the host government chooses to exercise it. Peter. When the United States uh, mining companies that were having trouble, when they're having trouble with regulations on polluting and things, do they try to work their, their, their business into China? Did they push the American uh, technologies into the Chinese uh, territory? Technology went in, in order to uh, develop these resources efficiently and in to process it uh, in, uh, in China. But by and large, it was simply a very rational business decision to get your inputs where you can get them more easily and less expensively. Let me, let me go on to other, other dimensions uh, of this, that the controlling of technology, which is mostly not around alternative energy or sustainable energy resources, that one of the things about the common narrative and the, and the article here is the Americans are restricting high quality trip uh, chip manufacturing equipment. Congress has proposed, or members of Congress have proposed similar restrictions on technologies that would be useful in processing of energy related materials. It's not yet enforced. So it's a um, imagine what you don't want to happen and then treating it as if it does ha is already happening and asking what effect this will have on the transition to cleaner and more sustainable. 
that um, uh, has in it, and I hope I don't, uh, my will, but I don't, I don't want to go through all of the links in the chain as to what's problematic about that chain of of assumptions, because the focus really is on other things in this uh, chapter and talk. So part of the core of the problem is the interface between managing the international system in the post-Cold War era, which is now about six, eight years ago, began to be redefined as the return of great power rivalry, which meant as a practical matter, we didn't have to re-examine the prioritization and the clusters of policies that we had developed from the late 1940s that prioritized security above everything else. You know, not getting in a nuclear war, not losing the Cold War, the military got all that it needed to keep us safe, and things like healthcare and education uh, and infrastructure and our communication system and so forth. Things were secondary in terms of federal priorities, state priorities. And if we reinvent Cold War 2.0, great power rivalry, then all of that stuff we did, we don't have to change. And all of those who benefited and got to be entrenched interest, coal. We spend a trillion dollars subsidizing coal. Doesn't seem compatible with an effort to reduce carbon footprint. Um, but dislodging the companies that benefit, the members of Congress and state legislatures that are put there because they have the support of those who benefit. And you can play this out in a number of, of areas. So it's hard to change things as they exist, no matter how sensible the change might be on energy terms. But it's not being debated, really, on what's the best energy mix that we should strive for over what number of years. And how would we go about pursuing that? It's the rivalry with China and China's partnership with Russia and Iran that's helping Russia and therefore is a part of this not yet called an axis of evil. Um, but the way in which the arguments are cast largely predetermines what the outcome of the debate is going to be. Um, the importance of energy to wealth, to power, to national influence, to security uh, is real. Uh, and it's difficult to exaggerate how important it is. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there's a direct link between access to fuel, water power, water wheels, coal, oil, natural gas, more hydro or advanced hydro, nuclear, that in order to have sustained improvements in quality of life and in modern industrial enterprise transport network, you need energy. Uh, and energy, as I noted, is unevenly distributed around the world. We are incredibly fortunate in the United States that we have more or less everything in abundance. M most places don't. Uh, there's oil and gas here. Uh, uh, there's hydropower over there. Uh, and the same is true of the now more important, again, use rare earths uh, as a, a, a shorthand. So the countries that have it both benefit 
and have a history of using the leverage that it's judged uh, to provide. That some illustrations of the way in which the United States has done this. We began banning the export of oil to Japan in 1941. Uh, because Japan had invaded northern China. There's a direct link from that to Pearl Harbor. There's also a direct link from the U.S. debate over when to initiate this embargo and when Japan seized the Dutch oil fields in Indonesia. That... It takes so long to develop the infrastructure for this stuff that if you don't move, you're going to get left behind. Uh, so anticipatory actions can be a problem. We barred oil imports from Iran in 1979 after the Iranian revolution, the seizure of the American embassy, the holding of hostages, uh, in it, we said we cannot Im import any oil from Iran. Uh, oil is a completely fungible, almost completely fungible commodity. So what we used to buy from Iran when somebody else, and we bought it from Iraq, and we brought it from Saudi Arabia um, and other places. And the international oil market is very highly developed, very agile, uh, an ability to adjust quickly because so many have a stake in it and consumers, voters, uh, or the equivalent around the world, put a lot of pressure on governments to make it work. We banned, United States banned the export of crude oil also in 1979. That uh, in response to both in 1973 and 1979, Arab oil embargoes, oil coming to us, we said, we're going to keep what we've got. We're not going to sell this to anybody else. We're going to take care of ourselves first. It's not an unreasonable approach, but it's like embargoing rare earths to Japan. Once you do that kind of thing, you provide an incentive for others to have a workaround or not be so dependent so that leverage is worth less in the future than it was the first time it is used. We led the ban, the UN ban uh, on oil from Iraq while Saddam was alive. It's, it's something that we've chosen to use and to do because we could. And one of the reasons we can do it, the United States is the largest producer of oil and gas in the world. That Saudi Arabia often thought of as the oil, Venezuela, which has the largest reserves in the world, Russia, uh, which is the second largest you know, producer of oil and gas, but we've, we produce more than anybody. And it had tailed off uh, gradually over decades until the combining of fracking using water and chemicals and forcing them under pressure to crack the earth and horizontal drilling. Fracking has existed for decades. Horizontal drilling can go miles um, uh, horizontally and it makes it very cheap to produce in fields that were not economically viable. And this can go on for a long time. Among other things, this reinforces pressures to use the political leverage from our own reserves. And it weakens the argument for transition to replacement. 
If you've got no oil and gas of your own, wind power looks pretty attractive when the alternative is you got to import expensive stuff that it's been cast and think of the Obama administration, the debates about um, subsidizing solar and the Solaria plant uh, in California, that, that this was nuts to throw money at solar when we had so much now cheap oil and much cleaner gas in the in the narrative that probably worth a, a minute or two who who are the big producers of conventional energy um that the it, it's cast in terms of US and China with the new ones but China is the largest producer of coal India is second. We're third. I think Indonesia is fourth. Um, we're the largest producer, I said, of oil and natural gas. Russia is second. China's first in hydropower. We're second. I'm sorry, hydropower we're fourth. Russia's fifth. We're first in nuclear power. China's second, Russia's fourth. China's first in solar, we're second. China's first in wind, we're second. We're first in geothermal, Indonesia is second. What I think is obvious, if you think about it for a few seconds, these are all big countries. If we're into an era of major power or competition, it's not just US and China. Why are these the biggest producers? They're the biggest geographically. Now, Brazil should be in there. Uh, India should be in there by sheer size. But huge geography, more places to have resources, huge populations, more demand to be met uh, in this. They all have a stake. We all have a stake in working out alternative arrangements. Green energies. Sustainable wind, hydro, tidal, are, they're inherently local. That you produce, you utilize them at a smaller scale. Or you have to invest enormous amounts to transport uh, electricity over distances where line losses are big. Think of it as... Uh, uh, warding your garden with a very long leaky hose, that the longer the hose you have to use, the more you lose out of it. And transporting electricity long distances. So for line loss reasons, for produce on a smaller scale at a solar farm uh, down in the Mojave Desert or a wind farm uh, somewhere in Texas, is changing the economics of transmission and it makes new requirements for storage. Storage means a battery of some kind. And that's where the lithium cobalt uh, really come in. There are all kinds of clever, maybe crazy ideas for alternatives. Um, one that intrigues me, is abandoned mine shafts. Some of these things go a couple of miles deep. And basically the idea is when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, you lift up a weight. And when it gets to the top of the mine shaft and it gets dark at night, you drop it. Uh, and it turns a series of wheels and cogs and continues to generate. I have no idea if that will work uh, technically, but it's a kind of a clever idea. Um, that is a, a variant of pumped storage, which we're familiar with in uh, California, where we use nuclear energy to lift water back up to the top of the hill so we can get hydropower. Um, again, it's just, it's, and if you do the math right, you can make this thing make sense. It doesn't make sense everywhere, and you can't have a small 
pump storage plant in Palo Alto. You might have a small nuclear plant or wind, but all of this stuff requires new players, lots of money, new technologies, and ideally international cooperation uh, to do this. Best practices uh, being adopted, reducing barriers to uh, access to critical elements along the way, standardization uh, in its production, its environmental impact. Uh, but we are a long way from this. And that's one of the points of the Great Decisions article here, that should we be approaching this with a goal of accelerating as much as possible the transition to a different energy system, a different energy future? Or should we make that hostage to great power rivalry, to competition with specific countries? China is the one-sided um, in the article. It's the one-sided because it's the useful bogeyman um, for justifying expenditures uh, of all kinds. But the problem is more complicated simply because there are other big countries. There are other potentially dangerous countries. There are others that are more unstable uh, that come into play. Oh, what's going to happen? Uh, and what, what should we watch? What should we watch for uh, here? That in the long run, we'll clearly make a transition away from oil and gas, possibly back to more uh, different forms of nuclear uh, energy. Hydro is still potential around the world, but I, I think I'm right that we've damned everything that you can damn in the United States. That, that's why the Corps of Engineers go outside the U.S. to provide foreign aid. It, this is jobs for the Corps of Engineers because um, we've got no more no more to to damn, um, which is too bad because it's a great form of, of energy. But moving towards hydrogen as a way of storing energy, hydrogen as an alternative fuel. Fusion, which is probably still far into the in the future, but wind, solar, geothermal, there are things that are within sight, within reach. How do we pay for them? How do we prioritize things in order to be able to pay for them? And how do we share, sell, utilize, the technologies that are involved to make life better, to strengthen competitive advantage for the security uh, advantages that are perceived to be uh, inherent or the uh, security requirements that are there. Unfortunately, the article doesn't lead anywhere in terms of helping to understand how these issues will be decided. That uh, a flippant way, again, in, in those of us who study politics, they, what are politicians going to do? They're going to do what their funders want them to do. And energy companies are major funders of politics, not only in the United States, but in other countries as well. They've got a big vested interest and there's a lot of inertia behind it. And there are a lot of people driving gas powered cars that are planning on driving them for many years. Um, I think the average car in the United States is 10 years old. Um, just extraordinary. Um, number to think about it. So the transition is going to be slow. Funding slow stuff is usually harder than golly gee whiz, we can do this in a couple of years. Um, 
the Biden pitch for how long it's going to take us to put charging stations all over. Nice idea. It's good to get it moving, but it can't happen. Um, uh, there are constraints uh, on it. Technical advances around things like solar, uh, more efficient photovoltaic cells, more efficient transmission, better ways of storing. It's not hard to imagine breakthrough kinds of developments there. What's a little harder to figure out is an advanced preparation around the um, licensing, environmental protection, culpability, um, you know, who's, who's responsible, who pays? If there's a, a breakdown like the analogous to AT&T, um, uh, just the other day, for whatever reason it happened, you know, they're now going to pay $10 to every subscribe. That's a lot of money if they actually pay. Uh, but who's going to work that out? Uh, and how do we get started on it? In an environment where the attention too much is focused on the reinvention of a superpower, great power rivalry that is predicated on continued access to the stuff that made sense 50 years ago. Uh, the inertia in this is enormous. Let me stop. Um, I hope there was some coherence in my presentation. Uh, I hope what came through from the article and from what, these are important questions. There's no easy answers to these. And there's no fast answers uh, to these. But the decisions that we're backing into, decisions by not making a decision, or decisions to do this for a little bit longer, both delay and complicate achieving a real solution uh, or a extended viability solution. So go home and think about it. Come, come up with a better answer. And right now, I'll take questions. Lou, you've got the uh, ones on the Zoom, and I'll take any in the room. So, Tom, there are no questions on the Zoom, so feel free to take them from the uh, room. Please be sure to repeat the questions, because we can't hear the back of the room at all. Okay, we will do. Hey, Tom. So I don't know how this factors into your thinking, but one of the things that strikes me as an engineer is that we often underestimate a kind of a momentum effect. LEDs were a kind of a fringe technology until, until one day they weren't. Yeah. The solar panels were terribly expensive and didn't produce very much electricity until one day they were actually cheaper than burning coal and so forth. And... I wonder what the, um, yeah, what are the geopolitics implications of that? If there's any. Yeah, well, the question, the question or the observation is that technological change can rather quickly and dramatically change both the economics and the possibility space for doing, you can just do different things. Um, and if you can do them better, faster, cheaper, it's going to happen, right? Um, I've got no more, no better a crystal ball than others as to what is going to happen. But one of the dimensions for the geopolitics of it is where does it start? Who has the idea? Which system is nimble enough to put it into production? Now I'm thinking now under you know, another one of my, my National Academy uh, uh, studies had where we remain the best in the world at getting stuff added a laboratory. We break down in terms of putting it into production. For again, a lot of it is regulatory and legislative um, and 
a need for people at an early stage before it's mechanized in labor costs. So other countries do this better or quicker than we do. And the geopolitics come into it of, are the incentives and the pressures to move as quickly as possible to reap the energy uh, and economic benefits, even if that means exporting jobs, which is a nonsensical because the jobs didn't exist um, until the invention of this, but strengthening a potential or actual political rival. Do we, will we cripple ourselves or hobble ourselves because of the characterization of a political uh, struggle or ideological difference or human rights uh, practices, values in there, all of which are important, all of which come into every policy debate. So I, the implications of what you say, I think are we're going to make all kinds of developments here. You know, guys like you in engineering departments and corporate labs are going to make all kinds of developments. Some of them will be funded. Some of them will make them across the valley of death where they actually get put into place. And here, that'll depend in part on the sunk costs. Some of this stuff may go more quickly into the poorest, most backward countries because there's nothing there. Right? There's nothing to be amortized. Um, whereas the United States and other developed, we're still paying for a lot of stuff that was planned to have a service life of 15 years, 20 years uh, or more. Uh, so there's a reluctance, and you know better than I am, the, the Sony Triniton TV invented here. No American company wanted to touch it because they had not amortized all the alternative technologies and the Japanese scoffed it up. Corinne? What about... It's on. The possibility that hydrogen could get us out of our energy bind. SoCal Edison last year committed to powering all of Los Angeles by hydrogen by 2035, then they slid that date out to 2040. On the other hand, for cars, for example, Toyota Mirai is a hydrogen car. Mm -hmm. And you can buy an almost brand new one for fifteen or $10,000 because the charging stations are failing. Mm -hmm. And there had been a ramp up to develop charging stations and almost as soon as they're constructed, they fail. So how widespread, if this technology is developed, could it be? And what would it allow us to do? Could we use it for aviation? That the, the, the question is, what about hydrogen? Uh, and hydrogen, the commitments that have been made by Toyota, by SoCal, on moving portions of the academy, a uh, portion of the economy very quickly to hydrogen in uh, 2030. Um, I'm very quickly going to run out of knowledge, but I, I I know a little bit about this because I'm on a board of something that uh, ran a big meeting in April in Japan for the Japanese government on hydrogen. Um, uh, and hydrogen, Toyota is one of the world's biggest promoters uh, of this, and this was for the Japanese government to get a government position for the G7 meeting on on of energy uh, ministers and uh, anybody who knows more than i do should uh, jump in and uh correct or expand but uh, it's a nice clean fuel but it's not so nice and clean to produce that if if you could find a deposit and take the hydrogen out of the ground and put it in a tank that's great. But if you got to make it out of coal or you got to use energy to split water to get the hydrogen, it's not quite take more energy going in to get the hydrogen out. 
but close. And I did not go to the meeting in, in Tokyo in, in April, but the colleagues who did, and this was, I think there were 23 countries represented at this thing. Um, and what George came back and said, uh, despite the strong desires of the Japanese to come up with something that would really endorse the prospects of hydrogen near term, he said, there's no pathway that anybody was able to identify to get there um, in the short term. Um, is that the continuing dependence on conventional hydrocarbons uh, and electric vehicles um, for uh, some time is, is seems to be where we are. Are these soluble problems? Can somebody come up with um, a way to produce it? Probably. The smart guys are working on it, but we're not there yet. We're not, and I yield to anybody who knows more than I do on this. Um, Matt, um, we, have a, we have a question uh, from uh, Zoo when you're ready. Go ahead. This is a doozy. What about <laughs> thorium? Would you would you not agree that if we spent maybe five percent of the infused the fusion investment on thorium with breeding, we would have substantial energy? And there are three things here that he lists as uh, uh, hallmarks of thorium. But uh, before we get into the technicalities, can you just start at the top? What about thorium? I have no idea what about thorium. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm afraid I've got no knowledge, no knowledge that would provide an answer. All right. Uh, sorry, Robert. Could I, could I ask, can I answer some of those? Sure. Okay, first of all, let's go back to hydrogen. Hydrogen is an incredibly tiny molecule compared to anything else, and it's incredibly hard to contain. I've been working with NASA, and I'm retired, on um, methane. And one of the things about methane is it's very leaky. Hydrogen is extraordinarily more leaky just because it's, it's so tiny. Now, something you didn't mention has also been in the news recently is that there's some thought that people can actually extract hydrogen out of geologic deposits. It's so leaky that it just leaks right through to where you're trying to extract the hydrogen. On the other hand, once you get it, uh, containing it is really hard. Sure, you can freeze it. You can try to put it into other other compounds, you know, your hydrogen metal uh, things. But all of this is just working with a very difficult molecule. Uh, that's that's what I would say about about that. Mm -hmm. Mentioned things about thorium, and I do have it on pretty reasonable uh, authority, which I can mention that it is just not a of concern for weapons you know, production. Mm -hmm. Basically, the idea is well, yes, it's conceivable that you could do a lot of work, you know, put a lot of money in, and make a thorium bomb, but there's so much uranium around; it's just no, not worth discussing. It's very hard to do. Uh, uh, secondly, it has a, I, I said it has a very short lifetime by, by uranium standards. Once you make a breeder reactor, breeder reactors are fine because you can't make a bomb yeah. with, a, with a thorium breeder reactor. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are you going to do? You, you, what you do is you end up with a very small amount of extraordinarily radioactive stuff which means it decays fast. And that starts to take care of one of your problems. Really, I think it takes too long, but it's a hell of a lot better than uranium. Uh, I think it's a thousand years or so. For a fuel. For a, for a half life of stuff you just can't get rid of by by bombing the hell out of it with other mm -hmm. with, with, with neutrons that you that you generate. I'm not even sure that that's an accurate assessment. It seems like you could just destroy anything that you worry about. As a, as a short term radioactive element that's the tritus remains. 
The rain has just been ignored. Thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, Robert, thanks very much for that. If you want to send me a link or two, I will uh, put it out to uh, the audience. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, Thank thanks, you. Robert. Great work, Tom. Okay. Really like Ed? Tom, you sort of touched on this uh, just glancing. Um, vested interest in the existing um, hydrocarbon mm -hmm. economy and and the question comes to me that one of our major political parties wants to just deny or not agree that we even have a problem right. and we have a incredible resource available to us. We just have to keep using it. And so why put new money into other things? Because we don't have a problem in the first place. Just keep doing So how much of that is re reducing American ingenuity and in actually bringing something to market when, like I say, one of our parties just says there isn't a problem anyway. So why are we going to put economic resources to solve a non-problem? Um. Uh, you, you've identified or underscored, uh, I think, a, a serious impediment to moving faster. Uh, the reason I went through that little litany of all of the things that the United States is in top uh, three positions um, for existing energy resources, um, and even if we didn't have the extremist in, in one party that's, you know, what me worry, what's the problem? Uh, why would we waste money trying to come up with worse alternatives? A and the public, that's it's not so bad, right? That that life here is pretty good for most people m much of the time. So th th that I think is the inertia is an enormous impediment that is compounded by the self interest. Um, to, to keep it going. And what I'm reminded of, by the way you asked the question, is the uh, advertisements that um, BP and ExxonMobil have run for years on how much money they put into research on alternative, greener kind of energy. I've forgotten them, they're, but they're big numbers until you compare them to, to the earnings levels of these companies. And it's coffee money uh, that, uh, is it important to do it? Is it better than nothing? Sure, but it is not the kind of effort that um, those who wanna get off hydrocarbons think is necessary and it would be necessary for all the countries that don't have the abundant resources and don't have the wealth to pay to import uh, again hydrocarbons again is a shorthand for all of this stuff um, that can't modernize agriculture because can't mechanize it because don't have the fuel to do it, can't clean up uh, food processing industry because production heat from electricity isn't readily available. These kinds of things that if one thought at a global scale and global equity, um, it, it would lead to different approaches and different outcomes, but it raises the understandable question of why should I degrade my life to help somebody that I've never met on the other side of the world and probably doesn't like me anyway. Uh, that, and this, this really is, how do you get there from here, a problem in many dimensions. But again, if nothing else from my approach to this, overcoming the inertia that is in the system I think it's a bigger problem than any of the technical obstacles uh, to moving on. Peter? This is also subject, but um, 
you were saying that in the 1970s, um, we stopped taking any oil from Iran or buying Iran's oil. But this brings me back to the previous speaker uh, on the Middle East. And mm -hmm. we have seized frozen Iran assets since the 70s. And yet uh, we still try to make deals with them about the nuclear stuff. Is this is this a big bargaining chip to say the banks have your money, but we're not going to let you take it out? Um, the, the question was, did, we seized Iranian um, bank holdings going back to 1979. And Peter asked, do we still hold this? Um, uh, and are we using it as a bargaining chip on nuclear and, and other issues? The short answers are, yes, we're still holding most of it, uh, which has been accumulating interest for decades. Um, and we began to use a portion of it months ago. I forgot an exact date. That I don't know whether it was held in South Korean banks or we transferred it to South Korean banks and authorized the South Koreans to release this money for humanitarian purposes, you know, medicine primarily, um, in Oman or United Arab Emirates to manage it for humanitarian purchases by Iran in here. So we were you know, beginning to dribble this out. And what started as, in the grand scheme of things, not all that much money, but compound interest, it's a lot of money now. Part of the, part of the, uh, the nuclear deal they're trying to do with them to um, make it a little more peaceful between the two of us? It was intended to lubricate the negotiations to um, restore compliance with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which is what that nuclear agreement, the formal title uh, uh, of it is that um, um, it wasn't a perfect but a pretty good agreement. Trump canceled it. That Biden had attempted from day one to persuade the Iranians to come back into compliance. They were in compliance. We ended our side of the deal, the Americans unilaterally. So the Iranians began doing things that they had said they wouldn't do. Uh, one was the level of enrichment, uh, that they would hold it below 20%. Um, and they now reprocess to a much higher level. And the higher you go, it's a, the easier it is and the faster. So they're within a very short time of getting getting bomb level. They try are they trying to make a, a green uh, nuclear energy um, plant out of some of that? That that's part of our policy is saying it's a cleaner source of something. Yeah, no, I understand. I, I, the, the question is: Are the Iranians trying to make nuclear power? When the Iranians launched their nuclear uh, program under the Shah. Uh, during the Nixon administration, the United States basically gave them a green light. The argument was, we want to export our natural gas, but we're going to have increasing electricity needs. We can do that with nuclear power, uh, and we're not going to get a bomb. But Kissinger bought that. You no, know, accepted that. That you know, those of us who were around here at Stanford in the seventies, uh, there were dozens and dozens of Iranian nuclear engineers on the Stanford campus. We trained most of the people that are in the program today. Um, and we, and I mean, we Stanford trained most of those people, and MIT trained the rest. Um, uh, and, but it was for nuclear power. I, I don't remember what the percentage is that people use that, you know, X percentage of what you 
need to know to build nuclear power facilities is what you need to go on uh, to build a, a, a bomb. And that the from my years of uh, in in government, I I'm the public face of the study that said it was possible to negotiate an end to the nuclear program in Iran that led to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, that we judged at the time, this is many years ago, the Iranians had all of the technical capability they needed to build a bomb. What they didn't have was triggering stuff. That it wasn't the nuclear components, it was the non-nuclear components that they didn't have yet, but could get them pretty quick, uh, was, was the judgment. So using the frozen assets as a blandishment to get them back in compliance, I, from my perspective, was a not unreasonable attempt since it was linked to humanitarian stuff. And again, back when I used to do this stuff, I constantly run up against choices like um, virtually all of the Iranian passenger aircraft are Boeing. Now they're pretty old. Now that the ones we have comparable age are sitting out in a desert someplace uh, in the airplane boneyards, um, but they still fly them. We won't sell parts, but American citizens fly on these airplanes. So the number of debates about how can we morally endanger the lives of not just Iranians, but Americans and other foreigners by refusing to sell parts to make these airplanes safer. Um, and that kind of argument comes up all the time. Medical equipment in hospitals. That uh, uh, the moral arguments against the, if we don't take a hard position on this, they'll just cheat some more on it. And the criticism of the Biden administration use of some of these frozen assets for humanitarian purposes underscores what a highly charged political issue uh, all of this stuff can become. Go ahead, Peter. You know, is this the Shah's private accounts, or how did he see no, these nations? No, these were the Iranian government accounts that the revolutionary um, guard, uh, Khamenei, took over with the, the new regime, the Islamic Republic. They inherited the bank accounts. And Iran, like most countries, keeps its money in New York and London. That's just the way the banking system works. We're a safe place to store money. It's easier, easy to use it. So the, the, the Russian money that the, the being debated now, should Russian frozen assets be reserved for rebuilding Ukraine after the war or now and people that say, we should use this to buy ammunition, artillery rounds for Ukraine right now, because they're not going to make it to reconstruction if they don't win the war. Um, and that bumps up against international legal conventions around safeguarding people's money. And there's a whole set of interests that thinks it's to the advantage of the United States and certainly to the United States banking industry that the rest of the world thinks that we're a good place to put money. If we start seizing their money, they're likely to change their mind on what a good place we are. Um, and you now each of these things creates examples and precedents and issues that spill over um, in ways that are hard to anticipate and usually flat out ignored by people who have a objective. 
Lou, do you have anybody? Do we have Lou? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> None at all. Anybody else here? Yes, Linda. This is a pedestrian question. We have multiple grids across the United States for electricity. Most of them are exceedingly rickety. They often break down. Many of them can't talk to each other or share any part of their grid if there is a problem in another mm -hmm. area. Given our current political climate, I mean, we're down to just a basic problem sometimes of keeping electricity that we've got circulating it um and and i so anyway, i don't know where you go with that as a question but yeah uh, Lin, linda's observation on the rickety grid structure in the united states and um uh, we ought to be worried about keeping what we got uh performing that i yes there are lots of local grids but they're basically three networks of grids East and west of the Mississippi and Texas. Texas has its its own. Um, uh, and Texas won, what now, two years ago now, that it all froze up in the winter, not, not didn't, didn't perform so well. But it didn't want to be vulnerable to a squirrel eating a cable somewhere in upstate New York uh, that knocked out the whole East Coast in, in the late 1960s uh, uh, there. That my understanding from when I used to go to things on the smart grid, that there are strong arguments for moving towards smaller, uh, more localized grids uh, and using them because of the, the ease of incorporating wind, solar, modular, nuclear, geothermal uh, in it. A problem with this good idea, it is a good idea, is the backup. That, you know, the backup when a power plant in Virginia goes out as we get more hydroelectric stuff from Canada. Um, that if these local grids are not adequately interconnected, then you have to have the local redundancy, um, uh, making it the a, more or less the equivalent of a nuclear plant. If you got a nuclear plant of whatever size it is, you have to have an equivalent amount of non-nuclear power that you can bring online during the month or so, every couple of years, it is going to take you to refuel the nuclear plant that you can't take it off in its entirety. And that begins to look not so economic. Uh, getting stuff from the Colorado River, getting stuff from the Pacific Northwest has a certain appeal, but the line losses uh, to carry it that far are pretty high. Um, uh, and again, the folks who know a lot more about this than I do of changing it AC, DC in, um, in transmission lines and burying it underground um, to reduce fire danger, um, burying it under the sidewalk because uh, it is aesthetically better. And people, <laughs> I spin with what's happening to their electric bills um, on this. <laughs> it's not cheap. Um, well, we could go home easily, but we could also talk all night. Um, in California, we recently were told by this, at least in Northern California, the CPUC, that they wanted to drop the incentive, essentially, for homeowners to have their own solar electrical collection mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. and instead go to these big solar farms that are out in the desert, where when they ship that energy to you, it's leaking, as you said. I'm not sure this really relates to our topic tonight, but what was the justification for, you know, getting away from a dispersed collection system to go to a centralized electrical collection system that leaks and is 
susceptible to major failures and everybody goes out of power at the same time. Um, I it kind of goes with Linda's question. I mean, where's yeah. the thinking that takes us in that direction where it doesn't seem from a layman's point of view that yeah. that makes sense to have the... I have a hypothesis, not, not knowledge uh, on this. There's a, a, a combination of if the government subsidizes rooftop solar in all of its manifestations, that's good for the household, the individual owner. That is not beneficial to the utility company. And the utility company, because the other side of it is they have to buy the excess electricity that you generate on the roof at whatever that rate is in there. And my guess is when they do the math, when they resell that, they make less money than from stuff that's generated in other ways uh, on it. So it's a corporate interest being distinct from uh, ordinary citizen interest and arguably societal interest. Corporations exist to make money. That's right. the purpose. They don't exist to be good citizens and they don't exist to be subsidizing us uh, uh, as individuals. So it, my hypothesis is it's an economic calculation of boards of directors and a political judgment of what they think they can get away with. Um, but why does the Public Utility Commission buy into that Corporate, clearly, that's a motive for them. I understand it, I, I, but I don't understand. I, I don't know why, and I, I mean, part of it, I don't know who appoints or how the governor. Are. The governor appoints the public. The PUC, governor, okay, I believe, um, uh, and somebody pays for the governor. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 follow the money is usually a pretty good starting hypothesis, but I don't know the okay. I don't know the well, answer. Maybe somebody else. Does. The Robert. Solar farms are seen to be in the military areas, like up by where Ridgecrest is. They make it's a mirage up there. So Robert? The military is trying to be green. Yeah. Robert had his hand up. Yeah. Can you, uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, these last few questions have to me bring up the subject of storage of power and that you mentioned that was batteries but my understanding is battery technology is not in a very good situation um it would even over like a 24 hour period you have sunlight um you know you have solar power during the day but then during the evening and the night you need the power and, and the sun isn't there if batteries were more uh, available more flexible that would would solve that for our cycle problem can you talk more about that please uh the 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 question is you know uh, solar power is, is only available during daylight hours so batteries become critical storage mechanism um it becomes uh, critical i guess the only thing i can say that um it relates to the topic and was within my realm of knowing a little bit um is the article and attention on the U.S.-China rivalry that has focused an awful lot on lithium. Who controls the lithium mines? Um, the story that isn't getting so much attention is that the Chinese are moving away from lithium batteries to it's a something sodium. Um, based on their, their new big facilities are not lithium. Uh, I don't know why that is. I assume that um, they see everybody else trying to run away from lithium. Maybe the, these other technologies are or can be made better. But I again, I just assume as a technological optimist that we're going to have more choices that there are going to be more ways of storing electricity. I don't know exactly what form they will take, but that the battery problem 
and the range of EV problem or the how long will your computer operate before you have to plug into it. All of that's going to be pretty different in a pretty short number of years. Um, that, but, but which one? I don't know. I don't know. And I defer to anybody who knows more than I do. Oh, perfect timing. There's three minutes left, and uh, that's enough time to uh, put in a pitch for next week, where the subject is, I think the topic is science across borders. But it is the importance of international scientific collaboration to the United States, the perils or the hazards of efforts largely by the Congress to restrict interaction with all foreigners or some foreigners or some foreigners that look Chinese uh, on it. Uh, the speaker is Norbert Holtkamp, who until the end of last year was the director of the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center and has been active uh, in a new program at Hoover that touches something I'm on the National Academy with how do we maintain the success, the capabilities of the open, largely university-based scientific research endeavor funded largely by the federal government, heavily dependent on foreigners. That whether you look at things like you know, half the American Nobel Prize winners are immigrants. Half of the entrepreneurs starting new businesses in the Valley are immigrants. That American high schools do not graduate enough S&T student, STEM students to fill the available positions at entry level on undergraduates of American universities. That we can't... the a uh, chip factory that Taiwan Semiconductor, Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation banner building in Arizona with lots of federal money is already delaying. They can't find the workers. They, they, we simply don't have enough people with the requisite skills to work in lots of advanced fields. And it's one of the reasons that we no longer have this agility to go from lab to production, that uh, lots of stuff goes to Europe because they're better at it. So Norbert's going to talk about those issues and why they are important to the United States and American security and economic competitiveness. Okay, thank you all. Lou, thanks for monitoring. Do you have any final words? Uh, and uh, the final word is that uh, we endeavor uh, to get each one of these sessions uh, loaded, uh, uh, translated and loaded onto the web so that you can uh, uh, view them at a future time. Uh, so look for an email uh, Wednesday or Thursday announcing that tonight's session is available for streaming online. So thanks to all of you who uh, joined via Zoom. Remember the Zoom link is the same for each and every session. So you should be able to reuse the one you use tonight. And I am now going to stop recording and uh, close the session. Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Tom. Thank it. you, Lou. Thank you all.